But ladies and gentlemen, it's, it, it's 5.30 and my eyes suggest we have a quorum. So uh, let me go to item number two on the agenda for the November 18th, 2009 meeting of the Creeks and Watersheds Advisory Committee. And let me ask Julie and Liz, uh, mostly Julie, I guess, to uh, call the roll. Chair Moldaver? Here. Mr. Bullock? Mr. Jordan? Here. Ms. Lomas? Here. Mr. Schluter? Here. Mr. Wilson? Here. Ms. Falcone? Here. Mr. Hockman? Mr. Justice? Yeah, thank you. So, uh, quorum is present, and our liaisons from the Council, the Planning Commission, and Parks and Recreation are missing what promises to be one of the most exciting meetings of the fall season. So, uh, my regrets to them. Uh, item number three is approval of the minutes from the September 16th, 2009 meeting. Uh, is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to accept the minute, the draft minutes. Uh, the September meeting as submitted. Are there any corrections or amendments? All right, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Are there any abstentions? All right, let the record show that the draft minutes are unanimously adopted. Item number four is uh, adjustments to the agenda. Uh, Mr. Benson, any recommendations? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, if it's okay with you, I would like to move item number 10 to uh, follow uh, item number six on the agenda. Uh, that's fine with me. Does anyone on the committee object to uh, taking the staff report early? All right, uh, so ordered. Thank you. That brings us to item number five, uh, public comment. Uh, any member of the public who wishes to address the committee on a relevant issue that's not already elsewhere on the agenda is invited now to uh, uh, come forward and speak. And we have several uh, uh, slips, and I guess the first one will be Mr. Uh, Vernon Michi. And could, could, could you please uh, uh, state, state your name for the record so they get it down? Mr. Chairman, uh, my name is Vernon Michi, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I've addressed it, uh, you people don't believe this will be the third time I live in the vicinity of uh, State Street in Alamore. I'm right in between the uh, Alamore and Delavina Bridge. Uh, this has been quite a problem for a long time in that area. We've had a lots of uh, overspill with uh, sewer from the city. Uh, I will try to start out. Uh, Mr. Benson is quite familiar with me because I've been calling them quite regular, and uh, I believe we come to agree uh, that something needs to be done. The main problem at this time is uh, 2840 Delavina Street, which is the Ralph's Market. On the, uh, uh, the ninth month, the ninth date of uh, 209, they pumped approximately 300 gallons of raw sewer in the creek. I had to vacate my house. It was stunk so much. I took a water sample that I put in a jar. Next day I called and there's a gentleman by the name of Jim Rumbly that came by. And we walked and looked and found out approximately where all of this was coming from. There's a loading dock in the back where they bring all of their produce in. And underneath the loading dock is a vault or a uh, uh, septic tank or I would guesstimate by the measurements that I can take, it probably holds close to 900 gallons. So this last rain we had, that water was all pumped into the creek. So. We investigated that, and this seems to be a problem since the store was built, and I'd say probably 40 years ago. So all of the rainwater, when this thing pumps, 
the sewer, everything goes in the creek. So what happened, they tell me that they have found them guilty or given them citation three or four different times. And uh, Mr. Rumbley told me that they could care less. So then I went down to the county and uh, got a hold of her, Kimberly Clayton. She came out and she gave them, uh, she inspected a Chinese restaurant because when I went in there to investigate, they were cleaning their kitchen out and they were flushing everything out the back door onto the loading dock. <coughs> so she gave them a warning. So I called back and we talked and she said, uh, well, I believe they had a legitimate excuse because somebody had gone to the bathroom back there and that's what they were washing. Well, somebody pulled wool over her eyes. If somebody went back in there, it must have been 50 bull elephants. Then they decided they were going to repipe that thing, which I believe was illegally plumbed. They took all of it. They were going to put the sewer. They went along to the loading dock. I would say the pipes were, what, three inches, four inches pipe, cast iron. And they went into the sewer system. So they says, okay, that's it. We'll go in the sewer system. Well, that's great. It solves the problem. But how do you separate the rainwater from the sewer system. So, Mr. Manuel Romero, I talked to Rebecca Bjorg. He took all of that plumbing down. So now we're down to square one. Same thing. Last rain, all of the stuff that was in there was pumped out in the creek because all of the rainwater comes in there. So this is where we're at. I also had a call from Ed Harris. I believe he's from the Urban Creek Council. And we went down and we walked and we looked around and he said, this will not fly. So I told Mr. Harrison, where did you get my name from? Well, I got it from the uh, newspaper, some little newspaper around town. Well, I want to keep away from them. So anyhow, <coughs> these are some of the problems we've got and I don't know if we have a solution. So they were working underneath the Alamore Bridge I was able to get the city engineer, and uh, he was flabbergasted when he seen what was wrong with the bridge. There's no right. footings onto the bridge. The middle span is just sitting on dirt. So they came down in there, and they were working on that now. So hope that this is going to be solved. We still have a problem there. You have State Street and Alamar, they come to a point. Closer to the uh, State Street Bridge is a great big gigantic boulder that's about the size of a Volkswagen. And the homeless people gets in there, and they sleep, leave all their trash in there. So I asked Mr. Conti if you get that guy with the bulldozer to push that thing out of the way, it would eliminate that. That rock is still there and the bulldozer went away yesterday. I believe they're coming back. Uh, also, I got a letter about planting trees and doing some landscaping along the creek. Well, there is a good project to be done right on that point there, right where State Street and Alamar comes together. There was enough dirt inside of the creek that that dirt could have been spread. I tried to talk to the engineers. They loaded it up on truck and trucked it away. That could have been a project that wouldn't hardly cost any money if it would have cost anything because the contractor would have liked to put that dirt there instead of hauling that thing away. And it's just, it just keeps on and on and on. So really what we've got, if you really go down in there and observe what's going on, it's a free ticket to a circus. And I mean, I could just keep on and on because the county wanted to clean underneath that bridge. The city was not ready. They couldn't get together. The county came in there and they busted all them big rocks, did a beautiful job cleaning that creek. But they couldn't go underneath the bridge because the city was not ready to do some foundation or whatever. The contractor went down in there, no plans, no elevations. 
We just started to break things up and did it by eyesight. So that's about how things are going. And now you still got problems underneath the Delavina Bridge. Told Mr. Benson that you've got two by 12 boards holding utility cables underneath that bridge. If you have a flood, then boards are going to float away or something's going to break. I mean, it is a problem in there. So Mr. Benson tells me that we might meet maybe tomorrow and we'll take a look at some of that. I also have a uh, agenda with a lady from the city. Oh, I'm trying to, uh, Kathleen Kefner. I have a meeting with her this coming Friday. See if any of that thing can be straightened out because she knows a lot of the departments and maybe we can get something done. But I am worried about what's gonna happen with Ralph. So thank you very much for your time. Um, thank you, Mr. Amici. Um, well, I, I, I wanted to, be, before I get to Mr. Jordan, uh, I wanted to indicate, uh, number one, that I think the city is aware of what's going on and uh, I'm hoping to get a, a, a more detailed report on this at a later time. Staff may want to uh, say something, but under the law, we can't receive suggestions under public comment and act on them uh, if they're not on the agenda. But I can assure you that uh, all of your specific comments and concerns are not only being noted on the record, uh, but they're being televised all over the community. And I imagine that someone in the city administrator's office or the mayor's office will probably see or hear about them and be on the phone uh, uh, some quality time tomorrow morning. But uh, I know Mr. Jordan had a question and Mr. Benson may have a comment. I think I'm actually on the same track as you and I, I think uh, I recognize the uh, Brown Act issues too, but if we need more than one person to actually just suggest the items that we heard discussed right now that were relevant to us because I heard county, city, some of it are code enforcement, some of it are creeks, but the part that you'll be getting involved in, if we could maybe get a uh, brief feedback at a uh, future manager's report, if that would be appropriate, just to hear a response that way, because we can't discuss it tonight. Does that sound good? Is that agreeable? Okay. Uh, and, and especially what I'm, what I'm referencing is um, the item of the, the sewage going into the creek from a commercial uh, uh, property if that's really true and, and or what, what steps we'll be taking to uh, take care of that. Uh, to, before we move, we have more members of the public waiting to comment on other topics, but did, did you want to note any comment on Mr. Michi's uh, presentation? Uh, well, as, he, as Mr. Michi pointed out, we've been in touch regularly. We, uh, Mr. Michi's one of our uh, watchdogs out in the community on Mission Creek, and, and I was just speaking with him earlier to let him know that we really appreciate uh, his um, his calling in. He he's a, a really significant uh, provides really significant assistance to our enforcement program, and um, uh, we need that from we need that kind of continued support from him as well as other people in the community to call in. It it really uh, you know trying to trying to get around the city and find. Uh, water quality violations that are happening all over the all over the city is difficult and having the participation and assistance from the community is really critical to the success of that program so I just want to thank him for being here tonight and for uh, continually keeping an eye on his neighborhood and his section of Mission Creek and um, uh, we'll continue working with him on enforcement and, and as well as uh, as uh, restoration efforts along Mission Creek there Uh, and Mr. Benson's happily married, so he's no longer available, but uh, I, I, I'm, sh I'm sure that he'll schedule a meeting with you uh, as quickly uh, as possible. But uh, we, 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 and thank you again for coming, and you're welcome to stay for, for the rest of the meeting. We, we do have uh, uh, two other uh, speakers. I think the next speaker is, uh, is it uh, Jack Trigeller? Trigero. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, board, for allowing me to speak. Uh, I'll just kind of read through this because 
Did it take too long if I become too extraneous or whatever? I'm a little nervous. But anyway, I've been in Santa Barbara a long time, since 1959. Uh, I was at the first whenever we had the floods and so forth in 95 and 96. I was at the first meeting that Cope, uh, who was involved in recreation, uh, had uh, down at Chase. And I've uh, watched you a lot on TV. And I've been involved with, uh, I've talked to Jill Zachary and a lot of other people concerning uh, Arroyo Burrow Creek primarily. And there's some things that I'm just going to kind of quickly go over, a, a kind of a historical overview. I'd say, first of all, I'm supportive of the philosophy of the Creeks Committee and the idea of reducing pollution and so forth. Uh, I would say just generally on some of the projects that the that you would get high marks for the visuality of them, very good grade and some concerning the functionality I think leave uh, a little bit to be desired. I know where Bonnet Park was from the beginning. I go through Bonnet Park just to look around often, and I think it's been improved, the northern part especially. Uh, some of their aspects of it concerning, you know, purification of the water by running through the park and so forth. Uh, I don't know how effective that is. Bonnet Park's a good idea for the west side. Uh, a lot of the ki people use the playgrounds and so forth. The next one, big project. Bonnet Park, by the way, was a good idea to inform the public of the necessity of being attentive concerning pollution. And I think it was a very good start. The Watershed Center visually got a architectural awards. A little bit expensive, you know, with copper drains and so forth and so on. And uh, did okay for a little bit. Uh, now, every time I go down there, it's closed. You know, nobody's in it. It's not being used. A $900,000 project along with the county. Daylighting Mesa Creek. Mesa Creek had its own basic water source, except runoff, you know, uh, during the summer. It's a trickle. Uh, you go down there, and at the upper part there of the estuary, the, the bridge uh, entrance to uh, uh, the park above it for the dogs is, is nice. Uh, the idea of daylighting uh, the water... Uh, there's no daylight there. It's completely covered over, you know, with foliage and trees and so forth and so on. All shade, just like it was prior when it was not underground. Now we come down to the basic reason I'm a golfer. I started golfing. I was with most of you on the walk around. I don't know. I was the only, uh, quote, civilian there. Uh, most of you uh, hadn't played the course. I think Mr. Jordan said he played it once or twice. Uh, most of you weren't golfers. I golf there once or twice a week, and I have since 1959. I don't know the information. I, and I've watched a lot of presentations here. Uh, I know where the erosion was on the course prior to the project. There might have been E. coli bacteria over on the third where they have the animals and so forth in the backyard. Four houses, and uh, I played the, I've played the course whenever it was just pouring rain, and uh, it always had a great drainage. Concerning the course, you know, you have 100, 100 yards, 100 acres of course there, and then the inflow from the adjacent houses, I think, seven acres up at one end and seven acres, so you have about 117 acres, and 
I've asked some people if you're getting a bang for your buck there, and uh, I don't know exactly what was going on with their thinking, but I know that basically when it occurred, and I've talked to a lot of golfers, I don't know, I, I was at, I was at a, a stakeholders meeting on this particular thing, and I was the only person from the public that was there. The engineer was there and the administrator uh, from uh, the city that overlooks, uh, that overlooks the uh, building and so forth, construction. This, I'm gonna go through this because it's gonna be short. I think the purpose was flawed. I don't think there was that much erosion on the course, the bacteria. I don't know about the, I know the drainage then was very good. The project, the design is unbelievable. You know, I hope it works out, you know, for everybody's sake. I hope, you know, I think it's gonna be beautiful eventually. I don't know what's happening. The permeability of the soil wasn't good. You know, you're gonna have, you're gonna have standing water there I don't know how they're going to resolve the problem. You have playgrounds right next to there. You know, there's, there's going to be abatement problems with mosquitoes and so forth. I don't know. These are questions that you guys, you guys have and you guys can answer. You know, I'm not, I've talked to, I don't know who the designer was, the, the fellow. I know he's a very nice guy and, you know, I wished him well and so forth. But I'm going to go through this and then I'm out of here. I think that, the, yeah, I watch what was going on concerning construction, moving dirt from this side to that side, too deep, too bad. You know, they're removing this and they're removing that. Removing netting. Golfers are rampant over on the, the school drainage area and so forth. Uh, so from my point of view, up to this point, I question the execution of the construction, the results of the construction, and I just hope that, that you know, in time things will be straightened out. I ask how funding was gonna take place, where we're getting gonna get stimulus money. I don't think Obama and his group are too interested in spending or getting, it. I know they got stimulus money for a lot of various projects. But the stimulus money is not going to be coming from the federal government or from the state government for this type of project. And I, it got started, and I don't know how much commingling there's been concerning funding, but that's it. These are some questions. Uh, the last thing is I was I put down was how and when is it going to be fixed and uh, you know uh, good luck you know I'm not against you you know but that's yeah, thank you very much I'm sorry no, no, <laughs> the, 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 I'm the, sorry about that but. The, thank you uh, obviously you're very caring and passionate yeah, uh, yeah. about the golf course and yeah uh, I'm sorry I know that's not on the agenda but no no it, the, 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 that's exactly what this uh, portion of the meeting is for is people who have concerns about creeks or projects or watersheds that aren't on the agenda to right. uh, get up. Uh, now, as you know, if you follow these hearings, uh, we've had a, a number of hearings on this subject, and of course there have been a number of notice public hearings, but I think Mr. Benson was planning to uh, update the committee and the community on the status of the project uh, uh, anyway. So l let me check with him uh, if he wants to give a brief response now or, or uh, later, I know that, for, first of all, anyone who's ever gone through a, a kitchen or a bathroom or a home remodel project, right. trying to evaluate what it's gonna be look like when you're right in the middle of it uh, is very hard, and then one day it's all done, and everything works, well, and it's beautiful. I hope so, I, you know, and I appreciate your patience, and uh, you know, uh, like, I, like I say, I, I'm on your side here, so. <laughs> okay, so let, let, let's, uh, let's see if Mr. Benson Wants to make any comments now, or uh, I know he's planning to do it at a future meeting. So, Cameron. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we can't, as you know, we can't respond to his questions uh, that come up in public comment. I'll give a, I'll give an update as part of my report a little bit later this evening, and, and uh, the project over on Upper Las Positas Creek is one of the things that I'll report on. But I do want to, uh, I do also want to thank Mr. Trigero for for coming in tonight. And uh, as he said, he he's been involved. He's been providing input and asking questions. Uh, as this project was going through a design process over over a several year period, and uh, we appreciate we appreciate those questions and appreciate the uh, the supportive manner and the way you ask those questions. So thanks for coming. All right. Uh, is there anyone else uh, for item number five? Public comments of the committee. Um, he hearing none, we'll close item number five. Uh, public comment and move us down to, uh, with the prior concurrence of the committee, to item uh, 10A, Water Quality Monitoring and Research Program uh, Report uh, by Jill Murray, the Water Resources Specialist. Jill? Thank you. Thank you, Chair Maldiver. Uh, whoops, I just did the wrong one. Oh, you looking for? Okay, um, thank you. Let's see. The, it feels like I was just here a month ago, but it was actually in June, and at that time, um, some of you heard our biannual update and reviewed the fiscal year um, 10 monitoring plan. But for those of you that um, are, have not, we're not on the committee then, I'll be going through a background on our monitoring program, work through each program element, talk about the research questions, highlights, some very brief highlights, and then a brief review of changes for FY10, and finish with next steps. So the goals of our monitoring and research program are um, to determine the level of contamination we have in the creeks and assess the impact of that contamination on human health, the risk to swimmers um, at beaches, and also to assess the pro any problems for aquatic organisms. We're also always trying to assess projects, um, and that uh, we're doing that in order to identify our needs, prioritize future projects, especially assess what we've considered pilot projects, and then very importantly um, is provide the public with information about water quality. The Program elements for the last couple of years, and this will change next year, our, the organization will change next year, are a routine watershed assessment, storm monitoring, project assessment, microbial source tracking, biological assessment, it's also called bioassessment, and creek walks, and I'll talk about most of those tonight. Uh, we take samples from all of our watersheds. Um, you have a copy of this map in your packet, I believe, and some of our sites were sampling weekly, bi-weekly, some are quarterly, some are only sampled during storms, and we use um, many methods. We collect flow measurements, we test for fecal indicator bacteria, we do that um, in-house at the Elastera Laboratory. We test uh, field parameters like dissolved oxygen, temperature, we test um, for chemistry, and most of this is sent to outsource labs, uh, metals, herbicides, pesticides, oil and grease, surfactants, and others. And then in the last couple of years, we've taken on a lot more toxicity testing, and that's where we expose, well, we also outsource this, but the water is used to expose organisms and see how long they survive. So moving on to the first element, watershed assessment. Uh, the question we get the most from the public is, has water quality improved? So we will always be looking for long-term trends, and um, given the variability in, in data, that takes a long time. We are always looking for new hot spots and new constituents of concern. And in the last couple of years, we've focused on looking at which um, areas in the watersheds are contributing the m highest amounts of pollution. So that's our sub-watershed contribution effort. Uh, we have focused a lot in the last couple of years um, on toxicity. And so the r routine watershed assessment is, is uh, exclusively dry weather. And so that's the measuring toxicity in dry weather. We also do that in storms. But we were concerned about um, potential issues with dissolved copper 
in the last couple of years, we've taken on um, sediment testing at all of our estuaries, and we'll always focus on beach warnings and looking at responding to those. So highlights for this presentation include looking at long-term trends, and that's going to be in terms of um, beach grades, and I'll get more. I'll get into that, and also looking at some indicator bacteria, and then also some results from our subwatershed loads. And I just want to remind you that I spent some time in June talking about the sediment assessment and toxicity testing, so I won't go back over that. But I did want to say that for the sediment testing, we had been operating with, um, we had used the state's draft sediment quality objectives and just crossed our fingers that that's what would be finalized. And so that has been finalized now, and we have finished collecting our third year of data. So I don't foresee needing to collect much more sediment data, at least for a while. And we also, I also talked about that in, in FY10, we'd be focusing a lot more on beach warnings and, and looking at our 10 years of indicator bacteria data and, and um, doing some experiments as well. So um, for some background on fecal indicator bacteria, I've talked about this before, but it's been a while. Um, indicator bacteria are groups of intestinal bacteria. They're human and animal, and they are used to infer the presence of sewage or human waste, and that is because if you test them in sewage or human waste, the numbers are very, very high of all indicator bacteria. And some studies that have been done have shown correlations of um, swimming rates with the concentrations of indicator bacteria, and so that's what's historically been used. And it's a method that's easy and cheap to measure, but it does have a lot of limitations, and those are really coming to the forefront in um, recent times. And the biggest problem is that the most indicator bacteria are not harmful, and most harmful organisms are not indicator bacteria. So that's why they're called indicators. Most of the um, organisms that make swimmers sick, for example, would be viruses that we don't even test for. And that's because there aren't any good tests for looking at uh, routine levels of, of um, viruses. It's becoming more and more clear that indicator bacteria survive and even grow in the environment, and I think we'll see a lot more of that coming out in published literature. And they, not all the studies that have been done with indicator bacteria um, show that they correlate with illness. However, it's what is used for the beach warnings. So throughout the state, um, counties collect, generally counties collect the indicator bacteria data and then base beach warnings on those levels. And... Um, Heal the Bay uh, Heal the Bay then uses those uh, numbers to calculate beach grades, and they do that both on a weekly basis and they also do it on an annual basis. For now, it kind of keeps considering every time the EPA has reviewed it, it's still considered the best we have. There isn't really anything off the shelf that can be used um, for, for testing yet. However, I think that's going to change very soon, and EPA is com um, has... Under, they're under consent decree to co review and recommend new criteria in 2011 and adopt the something in 2012. Um, so the annual, I'm going to look at annual beach grades and to look at long-term trends, and I wanted to just go over what those are. They're published by Heal the Bay, and I, as I said, you can go online and get the weekly grades for any beach in the state, and they create one letter grade based on a combination of the levels of enterococcus, E. coli, total coliform. If, they're, if you're looking at just the weekly grade, they give more weight to the most recent sample. Um, it's really, they have, they have the details online and it'd be too complicated for me to, exp well, I don't even know exactly how they do it. Um, so, simplistic, a lot of caveats, but it's something that we can use to start looking. And they break down the annual grades into wet weather, dry weather, and the AB411, which is wet or dry weather between April 1st and October 31st. And I'm um, just going to present the, west, the wet weather grades. This is for the Santa Barbara beaches um, within the city. And there's now 10 years of this data, and so that's enough to start, even despite some of the variability, do some statistical tests. And there is a significant improvement for the wet weather grades, um, if you lump the data to t uh, 1999 to 2003 versus the data of 2004 to 2008, and in the coming year, as part of that um, beach warning, more detailed beach warning um, monitoring and research effort, we'll be looking at that. Uh, we'll be looking at the same kind of analysis, but the raw 
the raw that indicator bacteria levels and also looking for causes. It's still not clear if this is due to um, rainfall patterns, differences in rainfall patterns. When I look at basic yearly rainfall or break it up to um, rainfall that's taken place just during the periods when these grades are determined, there isn't a clear pattern, but that doesn't mean it, that we won't find it when we go into the uh, another level of um, detail and analysis. This slide, I'm going to look at um, Enterococcus in, in Mission Creek, and this was the slide that I presented in 2006, and it was a time series of E. coli and Enterococcus at um, Mission Creek at Montecito Street. And basically, or what I really want to point out is what we were saying then is all this variability, there are no clear patterns. The, the noise r to signal ratio is just too high. And now, moving a few more years forward, we have, again, almost 10 years of data. And here you can see something changing in Mission Creek. The E. coli is purple, Enterococcus is blue, and you can see that there's starting to be more of a separation between those values. And um, I think the, if I, again, lump the data from 2001 to 2004, the median value is 400 for Enterococcus, uh, most probable number per 100 milliliter. And 2005 to 2009, it's quite a bit lower. And again, we'll go forward and look at um, the causes for this and look at other, um, we have more data from further upstream in the creek that we haven't even tackled. We've just gotten new um, statistical software that's really making our we can do a lot more in a lot shorter time now. So now moving on to um, the sub-watershed loads, and this is also a background slide that you, you have seen before. You might not remember it. Um, we started off in the Creeks Division always looking at, at um, concentrations of contaminants, and that's really important to do because the concentration is really what predicts the toxicity to organisms or the risk for swimmers. But we um, also look at the total am amount. We've started looking at the total amount of pollution. So that's we take the flow rate in the creek and multiply it by the concentration to get the total amount of pollution moving past a certain point per time. And then we can go a step further and take, say, the load at an upper site, the load at a lower site, subtract that, and then you get the amount coming in in that reach of Creek, or say for example Mesa Creek, we can take the load at the bottom of Mesa Creek and we can say that much pollution has come in from the Mesa Creek watershed. We've done this quarterly um, and the last time I presented results was just, I think we had just a single quarter done and this is, a, um, these results are an average of all of our, all of the quarterly data that we've collected and this is dry weather. I'm not going to go through every detail here but I just want to point out so we can look at the percent of flow coming into Mission Creek on average in dry weather. And so on average, 25% is already coming in by rattlesnake at, uh, rattlesnake at Las Canoas. Another 15% comes in from Old Mission Creek. Um, I should put this, I guess. And then 60% um, is coming in from the confluence of Old Mission Creek and Mission Creek down to Montecito Street or so you would say the Lower Mission Creek. And um, if you don't know exactly where Old Mission Creek comes into Mission, it's right around the Carrillo, um, Carrillo Street Bridge. It's just a little bit upstream of Carrillo. So then you can look at some of our contaminants, like for example, E. coli, 84% on average comes from that lower watershed area, even though that, that's quite a bit higher than the amount of flow coming in from that area. So then we can start pinpointing which areas are contributing the most and disproportionately high or low of certain contaminants. Um, enterococcus is, it's interesting, on average 13% of the total amount of enterococcus that we're discharging in dry weather is already in the creek at Rattlesnake. Um, and then uh, also looking at nutrients, and um, nutrients are, are pretty distributed, but interestingly almost no flow comes in between Rattlesnake and Rocky Nook Park but 10% um, of the total phosphate is somehow getting in the creek there. So to summarize for Mission Creek, um, about half the flow and contaminants enter in that lower stretch between the confluence of Mission Creek and Old Mission Creek and our lowermost sampling point, which is Montecito. 
um, we'd get disproportionately high enterococcus from Old Mission Creek and um, a discrete fraction from rattlesnake. The highest E. coli comes from the lower Mission Creek area and phosphate enters in all reaches. And I'm just going to give you the verbal summary for Arroyo Borough, not, talk, not show you any plots. But about half the contaminants enter between um, the confluence of Arroyo Borough and San Roque Creek, which is right below State Street, it's um, at the Hope Street Bridge, and the confluence of Arroyo Borough and Las Positas Creek. So that's kind of um, between State, underneath the freeway, and then down to Ver um, Veronica Springs. In and then about 10% of contaminants are coming right from Las Positas Creek. <coughs> and then picking up about 15% more down to Cliff Drive. We get disproportionately high phosphate from Las Positas Creek, and it'll be interesting to see if that changes um, uh, after the golf course project goes in. And um, the load, that we've always known that the concentrations of E. coli are higher in Mission Creek, but the, the load of E. coli is about 10 times higher in Mission Creek than, uh, 10 times higher, wh what comes out of, um, Mission Creek is about 10 times higher than what comes out of Arroyo Borough. And that's, that kind of knowledge is really important for when we move forward to our next step for um, looking into beach warnings. So moving on to storm monitoring, we are looking at um, what, which contaminants are we seeing at the highest concentrations, what are the total amounts of pollutants discharged to the ocean during storms, um, what's the variability? So when in a storm would we see the highest concentrations? And we want uh, some of those questions are geared towards understanding really what are the sources and routes of these pollutants during storms so that we can start to figure out which management techniques would be best to prevent them from getting into the creeks. And then again, we've tackled toxicity and um, from talk and focusing on copper. That we have some storms that will, I mean, some projects that are designed for stormwater conditions, so assessing performance of those projects as well. And then last year we had the ad, ad hoc T fire storm monitoring, which you heard about the last time I was here. So um, for FY08, we sampled six storms. Uh, the first flush, we. Um, this is the second year we had done toxicity in wet weather. Of Mission Creek, there was a, we did, um, it was a test, a five-day test of fat head minnows, so it's considered an acute toxicity test for vertebrates and found 100% survival, 95% um, survival for Arroyo Burrow, so 95% um, is considered non-toxic. But Laguna Channel, which we sampled really early during the storm, really as soon as we saw the very first signs of runoff, was 25% 25% survival. Um, and I'll just say we've, we've already gotten our results back from the first flush this year and Laguna, and we also sampled Laguna really early and it was 100% survival, so that doesn't seem to be necessarily a consistent result. Um, we did not detect any pesticides or herbicides in that first flush sampling and the metals were all um, low. The only exceedance we had was for MBAS, which is a test for surfactants. And we also contact, um, conducted testing for several projects. So project assessment, we are um, looking for improved water quality and we're looking for improvements both before and after the project and then upstream and downstream, um, upstream to downstream improvements depending on the project and, and how you would design the testing. And collecting baseline water quality data for future projects and then once we have the project in, trying to look at how the project is functioning. And I'm going to present um, some results from the West Side Surf Project. This is the UV project at Bonnet Park. And um, <coughs> I didn't plot this, but coming out of the discharge of the project, um, the indicator bacteria are, are basically zero. They're below our, our detection limit. But then that discharges into the West Side drain. Um, I don't, it's about, I think, 100 feet or 60 feet from the outlet of West Side drain. By the time we get to the west side drain, this is in Terracaucus. The west side drain is in pink, and then um, Old Mission Creek at West Anapamu is in blue. You can see the rain spikes on the bottom, and then the orange dots represent when the project is on because we turn it off during the rainy season. And you can see that when we turn the project on, the uh, the Terracaucus is definitely lower, and 
when the project is off, the enterococcus is, is up high again. But if you look at the blue line, even when the project is on, when we um, get down to uh, Old Mission Creek at West Anapamu, which is about 200 yards downstream, the indicator bacteria levels are back to a background level. And um, we have done some testing. It just it really looks like things are just regrowing in the creek. There aren't drains that are discharging there with any kind of sewage. There's probably you know some animal waste getting in, but it really looks like they're kind of returning to a background level and maintaining that level as it goes further down the creek. We, uh, this is not a surprise for us, and we put in the project knowing that we were going to improve water quality by eliminating all the pathogens. So we know the project is much, is very effective, and it's, it's much, much safer for the kids who are playing in the creek to be playing in that disinfected water. Um, but this helps us, like say, for example, when we move on to the Laguna Channel project, we understand what kinds of performance we're we're, we're going to get by putting in a project like that. Um, bioassessment is it's conducted by a consultant, ecology consultants, and bioassessment looks at um, it's it's into where toxicity testing integrates the effects of all the chemical pollutants on water quality, and this takes it another step further and says not just um, it's looking at habitat and water quality and what's the effect on the on the community composition, mostly of invertebrates. And then um, from all the data that's collected, an index of biological integrity is calculated. And that's the metric that's used to compare sites and compare year, year to year. So for 2008, levels were similar to 2007. Both of those years were quite a bit lower than 2005 and 6. And this is mostly due to those, um, the, the IBI really improved. Things looked really good after we had the scouring rains of 2005 and 6, and then a couple of the um, drier years have led to a re reduction in, in the what we would consider the indicators of better water quality and habitat. So for uh, now that there's 10 years of data for the 2009 um, bioassessment, the index is going to be recalculated, and then the same kinds of statistical tests that we looked at with like indicator bacteria will be performed on our, our bioassessment data. So here's just a, uh, whoops. So here, I'm not gonna go into this at all, but this shows we have um, almost 10 years of data, and then we have many different sites we're able now to look at um, the upstream to downstream effect effects, like just separate gradient effects versus development, because generally the upper watersheds are also less developed. And then, um, but I also wanted to point out, you can see, let's see, you can see kind of that improvement in, in uh, IBI for many of the sites during 0506 and then back down. And just to review um, what we'll be tackling beach monitoring and beach results more in, in FY10, uh, focus our storm monitoring on Arroyo Borough once the um, first flush is over. That's where we have our, our flow gauge and auto sampler. Um, we have started focusing on a new pollutant co concern, which is surfactants that might be coming out of um, slurry sealed streets. And I think we've mentioned this before that sometimes we think some of the foam that we see on the streets might be coming out of slurry sealed streets, but then you kind of drive around and try and figure it out and it just isn't as clear. So we've done a pilot test um, where we did a simulated rainfall and did the toxicity testing on the runoff and we'll present that the next time we're here. Um, we're gonna move forward with our source tracking research grant, which I think Cameron will mention in his manager's report. Uh, focus on dissolved oxygen and, oh right, f um, focus more on, on the beach warnings. So the next steps are to do all that work finish this report, get it online by the end of the year, um, and then come back in June and talk about this source, trap, source tracking, some highlights of our work uh, for the first half of the year, and that's also when we'll present the FY11 research pl plan. So with that, I will take any questions. Yeah, th thank you. Uh, excellent report. I'm sure the public can be impressed with uh, how many different research and quality areas are, are actually being uh, attended to during the course of the year. Uh, are there questions for Dr. Murray? Daniel? Thank you, Chair. Dr. Murray, this, uh, there's some pretty incredible data here that's um, really nice to see when spending big monies on uh, restoration and water quality improvement projects. It's nice to have 
a lot of this information to help answer many questions that come up, always more questions than answers. Um, uh, I think just be really brief, just ask a couple clarification questions right now and then sort of pass the uh, mic along. Um, the, the sample point in Upper Rattlesnake, where is that in relation to the bridge of uh, ab above the the parking lot park, can't remember what it's called. I'm sorry. I think it starts with an S. Schofield. Schofield. Thank you. In relation to the sort of the natural watershed, uh, Mr. Wilson, it's the sampling point is upstream of that. So it's right. Um, upstream right of the where, bridge. Yeah, right upstream of the Las Canales okay. Bridge, right that's where the hiking trail starts. That's great. Uh, thanks. You'd mentioned uh, in the storm watering about five s storm monitoring about five minutes ago, uh, talking about the the surf, the UV project at Old Mission Creek, you said that um, pathogens are being eliminated. I think you mentioned that when you said that the E. coli, uh, the indicator bacteria is essentially repopulating itself in that 200 yard stretch or so. And um, did you say that the pathogens are being wiped out? They're at zero? Did um, I hear that correctly? Well, uh, just by, by by definition of that we're, we're um, eliminating all the indicator bacteria, that, is, that signifies that we're eliminating all bacteria and the system was designed to eliminate viruses with that, uh, you know, the intensity and the time that the water is exposed was designed to eliminate viruses. We have not tested for virus elimination. Okay, that was where that question was going. And um, um, the, just the final question is, uh, kind of towards the beginning, you had a um, a graph showing E. coli and Terracoccus, and they were covariant, and it was a pretty complicated graph. And then um, I'm I'm wondering what that would look like when it was uh, when rainfall or flow actually was um, normalized. I guess normalized for flow, or use the word you use on there, smooth. Um, what would that end up looking like? You know, there was sort of pre-2005 and post-2005. Um, I think I'll go back to the graph. Would so you please? Yes. Um, so this data has been smoothed. It was smoothed with a recommended filter um, and had several smoothing steps. So it would take out the uh, single day spikes that's that's um, a variability, uh, kind of week to week variability that you would see. So this has been normalized for flow. It has not been it normalized has for flow, and that's the kind of thing that we can do in the coming year now that we have better, better okay. approach for statistics. When we have um, tried to, we have we have correlated, like, um, beach concentrations to load coming out of like Mission Creek, for example, and have seen some correlation. Is there another slide similar to this just before this one? That one. Uh, I think that's the one I was wondering about. I'm just, um, not to take you more time, but I'm just wondering what this would look like if, uh, if actually storm flow hydrograph was, if it was normalized with that, <coughs> but maybe have that conversation at another okay. time. Okay, that sounds good. I but would appreciate. It um, seems I don't know, there's something there that I think might might be of important value. Thanks. Okay. Uh, any other questions for Dr. Murray on her report? Uh, Roger? Uh, I have a couple of questions. First, just in general, do you anticipate that the fires will make it difficult to interpret <coughs> long-range trends, period? Question mark. End of question? Yes. That's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, I, was, I was really curious what our sediment testing results were going to look like um, from Sycamore Creek, which has a lot of T fire sediment. And they weren't particularly different because I think it's just a more rapid deposition of the same sediment. Um, for our storm monitoring, we should get some pretty sediment laden runoff. Right. And, um, so yeah, we will. 
take that into account if um, interpreting results we would, you know, if it looks like there is so much sediment in when we sample a rail burrow that this is not typical, we will um, understand that as we go to interpret the results. You're sort of begging my question. You're going to take that into account, uh, no doubt. But the question is, do you anticipate that it will, that there will be an, uh, that it will be difficult to interpret the data in terms of the long-term trends because of specific events that confuse that long-term trend, like the fires? I'm going to think about that more. Right. It's great food for thought. I'm the one, the data that we have the most of for long-term trends are indicator bacteria data. And it will be, and they are typically high when when suspended sediment is high. Okay. But that's generally suspended sediment that's um, not coming off of a fire area. So it'll be very interesting to see if that, that's different. Okay. Thank you. Some specific questions. Uh, on the fecal ba indicator bacteria slide, you said that the EPA is to recommend new criteria in 2011 and adopt in 2012. New criteria for what? Mr. Schuler, for the for the um, new criteria for assessing the um, risk to swimmers at beaches, so determining when, okay. how to communicate with the public, okay. and when and where to post, post warnings. Um, and on the subwatersheds of Royal Borough, can I conclude from the brief data that you showed that there's no indication that runoff from Ealing's Park is a problem with respect to water quality. Is that a correct inference? No. Um, we have not tested specifically runoff from Ealing's, and I think that we would only find consistent enough runoff to test during storm monitoring. Right. This was all dry weather, and um, we have never specifically tested Ealing's runoff during storms. Hmm then my suggestion would be to look into that. That's a landfall, you know, a, a previous landfill within the city and run off water quality concerns that are a natural issue for the lower water quality in that, in that area. So uh, it would be nice if we could address that issue and know that there is or is not problem uh, water quality runoff from it, Ealing's Park. Um, I would be more concerned about more the groundwater discharge from a, a a landfill area. I think the runoff during a storm is mostly going to come off the surface. That may be true, but my understanding is that groundwater is not within our remit. So, we, you know, we can't do anything about that. Okay. Well, we'll um, think about putting a where to sample. And the last, the last cons general concern I have is one of the, one of the areas that we're trying to support here is project assessment. And yet, when we've talked about previous projects, such as the uh, the golf course project, which is not the correct name for it, but we, we've generally agreed, if I remember correctly, that we can't evaluate, because of the variability of the data, we can't evaluate projects based on water quality data. But in terms of this effort, we're saying one of our focuses is evaluating projects based on water quality data. So can we or can't we make that evaluation? Um, and I'll maybe that's not a question. Well, yeah, I'll start with an answer to that, and I have a feeling um, Cameron might wish to add something. The golf course is a tricky project to assess because it's it's stormwater. It's it's um, geared towards treating stormwater, and it is hard to get enough data points to do a pre-project and post-project. Right. It's it's really hard. So you need about, I think, you given the variability of water quality data, you need about 20 pre-project data points and 20 post project to get a good conclusion of whether your project had an effect or not. And there's just, um, we would have to put um, our entire monitoring effort over several years to getting 20 good data points for the golf course. But doesn't the implication of that, or isn't the implication of that true for all the other projects we do because we don't have that intense monitoring in order to support a clear conclusion? Um, the, for the other projects that have been um, dry weather and we, we foresaw them coming, we did collect enough um, data points. For example, when I put, uh, put the graph up for the West Side Surf Project, um, if we hadn't seen how variable the baseline was and kind of what the average of the baseline is, we wouldn't even have been able to understand if we were seeing any change at the West Side Drain or, or Old Mission Creek. 
Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, you know, I always love to get the science report, so. <laughs> Um, just a couple of questions, and actually all my questions have actually been uh, talked about already, um, and I, sh I share um, Mr. Schluter's uh, feeling on assessments and stuff, but uh, in, in particular the golf course project, we'll keep calling it by the wrong name, um, it's, it's, it's always been my working assumption anyhow that anytime you reduce the flow and the volume, it's an assumptive gain just by that manner, and we can continue to say that, right? I mean, I know all the measuring and all the testing goes into this, but anytime I can reduce the amount of water that's flowing off of a property and not going into a watershed, we know just by assumption and default that it's a gain, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I can simply understand that part. And then uh, just two other questions on the, um, back again to the uh, state criteria review for beach closures. Um, I think both, we've had two people ask questions about that already. Are, are the review of those uh, criteria, will they have anything to do with, uh, with threatening the methods that we're using or have been set up or have invested dollars in, or are they s different than that? Um, okay, Mr. Jordan. First, the golf course project. We will have sampled at least three storms pre-project, and we have an inflow sites and outflow sites. If this project is reduces all of the concentrations of pollutants coming off, then we might be able to see that. You know, it just really depends on, we don't know the effect we're going to see, so that doesn't, we don't know exactly how many data points we're going to need. No, but, but we, we might, but I we, know you were saying it was reduced. beneficial no matter what, right. but we might also see concentration right. changes or suggestions at concentration changes, yeah. so we'll okay. look forward to that. Um, when I went to the it was a, it's the US EPA that's re revising the criteria and then it will be you know years or it, it be up to each state to decide kind of how fast and exactly what means they're going to use to be as protective as the EPA so we don't know exactly what will happen in California but when I went to um, a conference put on by the EPA that the person who was in charge of this process just kept saying we are waiting to hear what the science says we are waiting to hear what the science says but the the talk around the conference was it would probably probably move to using um, a method that we have invested in with Trish Holden. Okay, so it continues to be the best we have, yes. right? I have that drilled into me. And um, and I, again on the uh, on the surf unit, um, if maybe we could go back to that slide too, because I two people talked about that, and I'm still having the same question. Um, if it knocks the the indicator bacteria down to zero when it goes through the unit. What the heck allows the indicator bacteria to grow back up to the same level as it is on the left of that graph with rain and no treatment? I mean, what's, what's taking place there where you can knock it down to zero and then it can come all the way back up to, to pre-treatment levels and it doesn't come back to a uh, whatever the f right phrase would be, you know, where normally it would go to there, now it only goes to here because you started, at, you in theory, started at a lower level with that growth. Um, bacteria can grow really fast. So they can have, in a, in a warm, dark, intestine-like environment, they can have a generation time as short as 20 minutes. And that can occur, you know, that could be a lot of bacterial growth. And then if you have bacteria growing, um, on sediment or on the sediment in a storm drain or on the, the surface of the, like the inside of the storm drain, they create, they can create biofilms that are just sloughing off fresh bacteria. So um, it lo really looks like there's, you know, stuff just continually, there's sediment in the drain, there's organic matter in the drain, there's um, nutrients, and that is just continuing to produce bacteria. But pathogens, Pathogens need hosts to reproduce. So, you know, even if you had, even if you, uh, you're not going to have re reproduction of, of human enteric viruses in that same environment. Okay, it's just a little disturbing to see that that blue well line go right back well up again. It, it's if that's it's the line we're tracking, yeah. right? And that's um, and that's why the EPA is reviewing because okay. it looks like indicator bac bacteria might be a great proxy for. You know, the urban snot of storm drains, yeah. you know, just put, it's a, it's 
A storm drain is very gut-like, warm and dark, cloudy, it's the, rich uh, with science food. phrase, gut-like. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks. I, th I think this is going to be the highlight of uh, many city residents' dinners as they uh, listen to this hearing and try to uh, eat supper at the same time. Uh, uh, Natasha, do you have any questions? Um, thank you. I do, and I'm relatively new to this group, so maybe my question's been answered many years ago, but do you look at some of the sources of the bacteria and the pathogens, where they're coming from, so we can try and solve the issue as well as monitoring it? Yes, Ms. Lomas, that's a great question, Ms. Lomas. We um, have worked with uh, Patricia Holden, who has a laboratory at the Bren School at UCSB um, since 2004, and we um, the, and she works on microbial source tracking. So that includes developing methods to be able to find what what are the type of source of these indicator bacteria. And so, you know, would it be gull or raccoon or human? We have, as a um, group, decided to focus mostly on. Um, uh, bettering the methods that specifically are looking for human waste, knowing that that is what that, that untreated human waste, even in small amounts, is what would present a much greater health risk than um, animal waste or treated human waste. And so then we have gone and looked for um, physical sources within the city, and then and um, we just finished a subwatershed, or uh, sorry, we just finished the watershed study of the Laguna Channel, where we went and looked at s many different um, sites in that watershed. And um, so that should be like in your binder somewhere. And it's, that was the last year and we have, um, I could actually set up a meeting with you to talk about all of what we've done up till now. And then um, what we have, what we're doing now is continuing to go up the Laguna watershed. Um, what we found is, okay, so one part of source tracking is determining what the animal type is so, or human. But then, and methods are, are getting a lot better for that. but then finding the physical source is really, really difficult. Yeah. So we've gone up storm drain networks and you can, it's, it's just like a needle in a haystack sometimes. So then we got um, a grant from the state to fund Trish Holden to do um, continual methods development and it will benefit our city because it's taking place in our watersheds and our problem areas, but it's also geared um, to be published for coastal managers everywhere because everyone needs these tools. Great, thank you. Okay. So uh, I, I want to thank Dr. Murray for a uh, really detailed uh, and comprehensive update. And uh, I know if you think of other questions, uh, you can submit them uh, by email either to Dr. Murray or to Mr. Benson uh, between meetings. and. Uh, I know Jill always does her best to uh, respond. Uh, Daniel? Thanks, Chair. A um, couple quick questions. Would you mind refreshing my memory as to the reliability and the cost of testing viral pathogens? Um, I don't know of any commercial company, so you, it kind of has to be a relationship with a, um, University lab generally. There might be one company that can do it. Does the wastewater treatment test for viral pathogens? Not that I know of, and but I don't want to say that they don't. I know I, they probably do at their discharge at times. Um, it's, I think if you were to break it down, it would be several hundred dollars per sample. It requires um, a large sample volume and the variability is really high. And then a, a major problem is um, determining what viruses to look for. And then the next step is knowing how infective they are. So that's one of the main um, angles of new research by the, by the people that are working on that is how to, you know, it's one thing to find viruses, but they could survive for a long time in the environment. They also need a host to replicate. And then they might not even be able to. So the logistics are complicated and the cost is maybe not necessarily prohibitive, but uh, the cost poses some considerable challenges to incorporating it into the monitoring program, right? Yes. And okay. I mean, That's great. and just um, to, to be comprehensive, to look for one virus might be doable, but to look for comprehensively yeah. at all pathogens would 
not and be something our, our we could take on at this point at all. And, and regarding uh, measuring project success, and you had mentioned something along the lines of um, 20 pre or post project monitoring points would more or less be necessary for some kind of statistical significance, I'm assuming. Um, ballpark, rough, won't hold it to you. What is the cost of getting something like 20 pre-project monitoring data inputs so um. that specifically um, project success could be evaluated more quantitatively? Well, it just really entirely depends on what you're testing for. If it's indicator bacteria, it's $24 a test plus staff time. If it's um, pesticides or herbicides, it's a couple hundred dollars per group of pesticide or herbicide. If it's toxicity, it's several hundred dollars per sample. You just, you'd made a comment that it more or less represented the entire m annual monitoring budget. So I was just trying to get a rough idea so that if it valued it in the future when looking at future projects and I coming up with a budget for it, does it make sense to budget a certain additional amount to be able to get that information? Um, we get that information for most of our dry weather projects, if not all of them. Um, but it's the storm monitoring, and that's, I was saying it would take our entire storm monitoring budget, and I was thinking of staff time too, um, mm -hmm. to try and get to focus just on the golf course, and then we'd be, we just would be dropping um, all of our other storm monitoring efforts. I mean, that's S several years, uh, you know, depending on the, the storm patterns, but they'll be sampling every storm, and, and we are not geared to do that right now. Great, thank you. So that, w that was it just for my questions. I did okay. had two just really brief comments. Okay. And one is regarding Mr. Schluter's question regarding the fire damage. Um, this is a half a question and half just a thought. Is I'm, I would actually suspect that uh, um, pollutants associated with the fire in the Sycamore watershed would probably take up to a couple to several seasons to maybe make it down into the stormwater samples. They have to sort of make it down through the soil and, and the like. So it's just a thought that may or may not be true. Um, but might not show up immediately, say, in the first flush. Sediment wood and maybe ash from the chaparral wood, but not necessarily, uh, you know, asbestos, uh, fireproofing and shingles and so on and so forth. And the other comment is um, it seems meritorious to consider uh, focusing some more effort, maybe when the time comes right for reallocating uh, staff resources and money in the monitoring program to uh, look a little bit more specifically at the, the process of attenuation of pathogens, specifically in natural environments or uh, human, slightly altered natural environments, such as uh, daylight in Mission Creek or above Rattlesnake Creek above the bridge if bacteria levels in Old Mission Creek Bonnet Park are within 200 yards, going right back up to pre-project conditions, um, it seems that if we can answer some more of the questions as to the actual uh, process or fate and transport of how that um, attenuation occurs, that might be able to help guide our actual um, work program and capital projects in the future. Thank you for that suggestion. We do um, um, generally, uh, so attenuation, I, um, are you also referring to regrowth? Uh, specifically uh, regrowth, but so then increasing. But then there's also the, the natural decrease of pathogens as well, such as you made a comment that say at point A to point B subtracted, that's how much is added. Well, there's also subtraction going on there too, but I'm specifically referring to uh, the multiplication or the, the growth of we, um So we have done sampling at uh, the SURF project to look at that, and we just haven't analyzed that data yet. And then I have presented um, before, it's been a while, that we've seen that um, change at, at the Mesa Creek from the Daylighting project, that before the project went in, 
we didn't t typically see any change in indicator bacteria level from upstream to downstream. But then, when we took out the project, when we took out the pipe the storm drain, we now usually see a, a decrease in indicator bacteria. And then we have also done um, kind of taken samples every every 50 yards, and, and I've shown you those before but too. Specifically, if maybe uh, intensity of sunlight or velocity of water as it moves down gradient. Um, type of vegetation roots, uh, soil, uh, amount of silter clay to chelate, you know, those kinds of things might yes. really help with uh, designing projects in the future. Not easy to answer any of those, but um, probably pretty worth it, worth conversations in the future. Yeah, we, when we can definitely talk about this more and maybe we should, we could reinvigorate the sub, the water quality subcommittee, but um, in my, from my, from where I stand, what you're describing is more, um, academic level or something that we p could pay a consultant to do. Uh, those are all, each one of those projects that you mentioned is is about the size of our monitoring program. Maybe we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Right, so keeping abreast of the literature is a very efficient way to go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that, uh, oh, okay, thanks. I have one more question. Um, have you considered all the um, application of FOSCheck that's been added in your uh, sampling? It may alter quite a bit because we know that FOSCheck will kill fish, so it's a high um, a phosphate and ammonia material, so that may skew your um, readings, at least temporarily. Um, yes, thank you. We did... Um, toxicity testing at Sycamore after the T fire and this was quickly so this was like surface you know surface runoff and we also did Mission Canyon after Hesusita and we did not find um, any toxicity but that but we also didn't sample really late into the storm at all because for Sycamore um, the evacuation order was called yeah right we, we did talk about trying to, like, could you apportion the, uh, phosphate coming out to phoscheck versus all of the increased nutrient runoff you're going to see after a fire, and that was, it's just not really um, very tractable. Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you, committee members. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Murray. Uh, if, if you have questions that you think of later, be sure to send them via email uh, to Jill or to Cameron. Uh, meanwhile, I have to remind you that we had taken item number 10, which is now completed uh, out of order. And so we still have to go back to item number six and uh, do the main part of the meeting. So uh, thanks again, uh, and happy Thanksgiving, Dr. Murray. Uh, uh, Cameron, uh, anything on uh, item six, committee member and staff communications? Uh, any committee members have anything to report on item number six? All right, uh, completing that, it moves to item number seven, uh, the election of the uh, vice chair. Uh, as you recall, uh, that position became vacant when uh, Mr. Weber uh, took um, uh, an exciting new position, uh, which had so many time constraints that he had to uh, recently uh, resign from the committee. And the purpose of the vice chair is not only to back up and stand in the place of the chair during the current year, but to prepare themselves uh, for all the business of the committee uh, with the staff, uh, with the council, and with the planning commission, and with the parks and recreation commission, with the anticipation that next year the vice chair, um, if we stay with our normal procedure, would be succeeding me as chair. And uh, so this would be uh, an appointment for uh, the unexpired portion of Mr. Uh, Weber's term. Uh, are there any questions before we seek nominations? Uh, Daniel? As having uh, nominated Mr. Weber and him being gone, I feel only responsible to uh, further a nomination and recommend that uh, Ms. Lomas be vice chair should she uh, uh, agree to receive that nomination. Uh, uh, Natasha? I feel I'm too new to the group to be able to play that role yet, maybe down the road. Uh, okay, but I mean, you could run to be governor of Alaska or something. <laughs> uh, are, 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 there, are there any other uh, nominations? But thank you. Yeah. 
Uh, any other nominations? Um, would, would Mr. Jordan object if uh, if I asked him to place his name forward? Asking you to place it forward. Yeah. All right. Would, would, would you be willing to serve? Uh, barring anybody else's uh, enthusiasm for this uh, this role, I, I certainly don't have a problem uh, stepping in in this situation. So. Uh, uh, well, Mr. Wilson? Thanks. Just to further complicate things, I'd like to uh, offer a nomination for uh, Mr. Schluter, should he choose, considering that um, I think one of the uh, one of the responsibilities of committee members is to have a, a bit of a revolving chair and to uh, sort of share the hat around as well with all due respect to Mr. G Mr. Jordan, should Mr. Schluter choose to uh, step into that position. I, I, I feel the winds of a draft blowing, Roger. Uh, are, are you being swept up? Well, I think Mr. Jordan is far more qualified than I am, but um, if nominated, I would serve, or uh, however that phrase goes. Yeah, I'm, I'm open with that. Uh, are, are there any other nominations? No. Yeah, you, 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 have, you, you, have, you have to put your, your dry wet into the microphone with the light on. Um, yeah, all right. Uh, I I think we I think we have two nominations, Mr. Schluter and uh, Mr. Jordan. Uh, should we do this just by a show of hands? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, all uh, all th all those in favor of uh, uh, Mr. Jordan uh, to be vice chair, uh, uh, raise your hand. All right, yeah, and uh, do, do you get that total? All right, and all those uh, in favor of Mr. Schluter being chair, please raise your hand. And and, 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 and those who are abstaining, please raise your hand. Uh, all right, so, so well, the, the, this has been on the agenda and been continued three times, but uh, all right. As I understand it, the uh, vote is uh, three for Mr. Jordan, one for Mr. Schluter, and one abstention. And and Mr. Bullock isn't here. Uh, all, all right. So I I think given that breakdown of votes, um, uh, Mr. Jordan is named to the unexpired term for Mr. Weber as uh, uh, vice chair, and uh, there may or may not be a, a contingency. Uh, uh, to consider in the January meeting, but we'll find out uh, about that later. Uh, that brings, uh, and, 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 and I, I, I want to I thank both Mr. Schluter and Mr. Jordan for uh, offering to serve uh, in, in for the nominations. Uh, that brings us to uh, item number eight, uh, subcommittee reports. Uh, Mr. Benson, are there any reports uh, from any of the subcommittees since our last meeting? Uh, Roger? The item is sub uh, subcommittee appointments, not reports. Oh, I, 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 I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm getting tired, too. Uh, ca can you remind us uh, what the openings are? <coughs> yes, and, and, and also, whether Mr. Bullock, who's not here, had expressed any time or interest uh, uh, for any of the particular vacancies. Uh, I'll take the second question first. Uh, uh, Mr. Bullock called to express his regrets. He wasn't going to be able to make it tonight. He did not. Uh, uh, indicate any interest in the in the subcommittees. However, I want to point out we have we have three subcommittees, uh, two, one standing subcommittee which is our budget subcommittee, and two ad hoc committees. Uh, one is our watershed subcommittee, and the other is our outreach and education subcommittee. The ad hoc committees uh, are both working on specific projects. Those committees will be repopulated and at our February meeting, that's our kind of our annual tradition, um, and new appointees will fill those spots for, um, for, the, fa for the remainder of next calendar year. Um, so 
for the watershed subcommittee and the outreach and education subcommittee. We don't have any meetings scheduled at this time before before February, so uh, the urgency is less. Um, although there are two two positions vacant on the watershed subcommittee, uh, Mr. Wilson is the third member of that committee, and uh, one position available on the education outreach subcommittee. And the current members of that committee are Mr. Jordan and Mr. Moldaver. Uh, and then, lastly, with the budget subcommittee. Uh, we have one position available currently uh, serving on the committee are Mr. Moldaver and Mr. Schluter. And uh, we we will likely have a uh, budget subcommittee meeting sometime in January before any other appointments or changes would be made. So, Mr. Jordan? Um, so <coughs> I, I, I guess I'm, I'm getting mixed readings there, but my suggestion would be that Mr. Bullock will be willing to serve on a subcommittee uh, when we get him in here next. And that uh, we're also uh, three weeks away from, from the end of recruitment and selection of a vacant party on this committee, correct? Correct. There was uh, one spot being advertised. Correct. And I'm presuming we'll have somebody being looked at. I haven't looked at that. And uh, given some of the other uh, dynamics at play is there any reason other than the than the budget committee that this the, the the entire topic couldn't be put off till to the January meeting as a suggestion well of course that's up to the pleasure of the committee it was this was a uh, item that was requested by a committee member at the last meeting that this be placed on the agenda so I wanted to make sure the committee had the opportunity to fill all the available seats no oh, I I think, uh, Mr. Jordan and Mr. Benson, that's uh, an excellent suggestion, but the budget committee slot in these uh, challenging uh, uh, times for all government agencies is probably very important. So let me see if there's anyone present uh, who has an interest in serving on the budget subcommittee, uh, given that this committee does meet uh, uh, every year uh, and usually more, more than once or twice. Yeah, Roger? Yes, I think that uh, given Mr. Jordan's uh, vice chairmanship that he should be on the budget committee and if we have that filled, uh, I'm more than willing to give up my slot so Mr. Jordan could take that. <laughs> oh, Michael? Well, I would Frankly, I wasn't listening close enough to Cameron's explanation, but there's a there's a there's just a, a flat vacancy right now on the budget committee, right? A flat out opening. Yes. And sorry, yes, uh, Mr. Weber was the third member of that committee, and then when he resigned. Okay. And and traditionally, historically, we have had the chair serving on that committee usually, Correct. right? So I I I, I agree. Um, I just again I hesitate. Uh, given that there's one person not there, there's actually two people not here tonight that will be here in January looking for, uh, or in one person in December, one person in January that will be looking for committee assignments. So I agree that the budget committee has a certain emphasis that might transcend that. So if, if that's the only one we need to resolve, certainly I'm agreeable. And uh, uh, Mr. Benson, have, have you electronically distributed the description of um, all the uh, standing committees and the occasional ad hoc committees uh, to all, all the committee members uh, recently so people would have an idea of what's involved with serving? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have not, but I would be happy to give a, a brief description. As I said, the Budget Committee is the only standing committee. That's a, that's a permanent committee because it's focused, uh, obviously, on our annual Creeks Division budget. Um, the the sub I, I work directly with the subcommittee members. They're noticed public meetings. Uh, they're they're it's a Brown Act committee, so we do public notice, and the public's invited to attend all of those meetings. We generally do two or uh, have two or three meetings scheduled before uh, our our budget is complete and presented to the city council. Um, and we ha and we have two ad hoc committees. The ad hoc committees are set up to work on a specific project or specific program. 
our watershed subcommittee is currently uh, working on the, the plan Santa Barbara update and we have convened to review uh, proposed city policies that, that may be part of the general plan update uh, to look at them with regard to creek and ocean water quality related issues and provide input to this committee and then this committee providing input to the Park, com park Commission and um, the uh, Planning Commission and City Council. The, out the Education Outreach Subcommittee has been participating in an update of, of, our, of the Creeks Division Public Education Plan and uh, we're getting close to, to finalizing that plan so we will have, we will have a meeting to review the, the uh, draft edits probably within the next three months, uh, three to four months and um, that's the specific purpose of that committee. Once, once the purpose of the committee is, is complete, those committees dissolve. Thank you very much. Um, if there are no objections, well, Roger. I'm not sure how we do this, but I would move that Mr. Jordan be added to the budget committee and that the other two committees, the watershed and outreach, uh, be postponed uh, until January. And is there a second? Second. Right, it's been moved and seconded to uh, approve Mr. Jordan to the vacancy on the Standing Budget Committee and to defer selection for the ad hoc committees until the January meeting. Are there any questions or comments on the motion? Right, hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Are there any opposed? Are there any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. Uh, thank you, Mr. Schluter. That brings us to item number nine, uh, the manager's report. Cameron? Uh, I'm sorry. I, uh, I thought Mr. Schluter's motion just was speaking to the ad hoc committees. It was to uh, confirm Mr. Jordan oh, okay. for the vacancy sorry. Sorry, on uh, budget and to postpone selection for the ad hoc until the January meeting. And that carried unanimously. So I think that completes item number eight, which brings us to item number nine. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, got a number of uh, creek restoration, ocean water quality things to update the, the committee about this evening. Um, first of all, I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the status of the burn area and the, um, the rain event we had in the middle of October. Um, I gave a presentation, I think, maybe two meetings ago about the, the work being done uh, to prepare for winter rains in, in all of the fire areas. T-Fire has the seat of fire in particular for the city. Most of that work was completed uh, prior to the October 13th uh, rain event. Um, and uh, on October 13th, we had a very significant early season rain event. And uh, according to the, the county flood control, uh, district records, the storm dropped 3.64 inches of rain in Santa Barbara. I wanted to show you some, some slides just to show you how significant that is for, a, um, for an October rain event. The county has been collecting data on, on storm events since 1881, 144 years. Uh, that was the second largest October storm event the city of Santa Barbara has seen. Um, up on the top of San Marcos Pass, which, which you would assume would have the largest impact on the, on the fire area, uh, we had 9.79 inches of rainfall. And that, that rainfall for October was by far the single largest rain event on record uh, we have, or in the last 45 years, um, since 1966, it says. Just to give you a picture of overall rain events, not just for October, not just early season, but that was the third largest rain event up on the up on the top of the pass in in recorded history. <laughs> so, big uh, big rain event. Uh, remarkably, even with those high rain totals, uh, very little uh, damage. Creeks stayed within their banks. No significant debris flows uh, or or rock slides. Um, 
not a, not a lot of significant erosion uh, on the hillsides or in the creeks. Having said that, the the rainy season is just beginning now, and the city and county offices of emergency services are encouraging residents to prepare for uh, future rains this season. And they there are two upcoming flood preparedness meetings that they're that the uh, offices of emergency services are, are providing. One is tomorrow, uh, November 19th. That's going to be at Franklin Elementary School Auditorium at 6 o'clock, and it's open to the public. Another flood preparedness meeting is being planned for December 10th at the Faulkner Gallery in the main library, and that is, uh, that's also beginning at 6 o'clock. So December, tomorrow, uh, November 19th at 6 o'clock at Franklin School, and December 10th, 6 o'clock at the Faulkner Gallery. And there will be representatives there from the National Weather Service and uh, County Flood Control District, uh, Red Cross, and the city and county offices of emergency services. Um, next, I wanted to, to give you all an update on the uh, Upper Las Positas Creek Restoration Stormwater Management Project. And um, you all should be forgiven for continually referring to this as the golf course project because uh, although it looks a lot like a golf course, that's only because the this is actually the uppermost reach of the watershed for Las Positas Creek, which is one of the largest tributaries to Arroyo Burrow, and it has been modified over the years to look a lot like a golf course. And um, and so what we are doing as part of this project is is restoring portions of it to look a lot more like uh, Las Positas Creek. And so it's harder to say this name than it is to say the golf course project, but that's but that's what we're working towards. And um, in that regard, I want to start out by letting you know that we've We've now got gotten over 4,000 uh, native plants in the ground and planted. We've just taken delivery on anov another several thousand. So over the course of the next few weeks, we'll get those plants in the ground. And with this one project, we'll, we will almost have doubled the number of native plantings that the Creeks Division has, has done in its entire uh, eight-year history. So. What I wanted to, what I really wanted to let you know about was um, what we learned dur during that big storm event with this project. Of course, uh, when we're building a project into October and even into November, uh, we we expect to have some rain. Uh, we got a little bit more than we th we thought we would, and we have some bad news and some good news that came from that. And uh, the good news is we got to see the project in action, and. Uh, in, a, in a rain event. The bad news is we had some problems. We, it helped us diagnose some design failures, uh, and we've been working on those things ever since. And, um, and the good news is we still had the construction crews out there, so we're able to, to remedy the problems that, that we observed. Now, as you know, this, this project uh, consists of construction of a series of bioswales, uh, detention and retention basins that will detain and, and filter polluted storm runoff. And uh, we had a, a member of the public earlier talking about what kind of pollution we, we might have on the golf course. We did a fairly significant amount of, of uh, testing to get some baseline data and found uh, high levels of, of uh, a, a whole range of pollutants coming off uh, Las Positas Road. Uh, up here and the the surrounding neighborhood, which all drains onto the golf course property, uh, we we found high levels of of uh, pollutants coming out of a neighborhood that is up here that is now being redirected and drained and and treated on the golf course property, and we found high levels of indicator bacteria along this s the western section of the course uh, by a neighborhood over there. There is additional. Um, even even in areas that are that were just draining the golf course, we were we were finding um, high levels of contaminants. So, uh, so this project is designed to treat those areas. It I think in total treats uh, 140 acres of the upper watershed. Um, I wanted to, I want to just tell you briefly where we saw the most the most uh, significant damage and and uh, what we've been primarily focused on. 
we'll break it into two general areas. We have two large retention basins. One is one is located right here, and that's that's a, a location where we would be collecting and holding water uh, that would be treated through infiltration, evaporation, uh, and plant uptake uh, and evapotranspiration. Same thing with a a large uh, basin that's down in this section of the project. In both cases, the the engineers who designed the basins uh, used a a pipe material that was not designed to handle pressure and installed a, a valve gate at the downstream end of that pipe that was not designed to handle the, the head pressure that built up into those berms. So what the, the closure on the gate caused when the, when the berm started collecting water was a pressurized uh, situation inside the pipe. And so uh, the, there's potential that the pipes, the pipes were damaged and, and would potentially fail. At any rate, we've got we've got a non-pressure uh, rated pipe inside the berms in a pressure in a potentially pressurized situation. We're going back in. The design engineer has redesigned that portion of the berm. We're going back in, excavating that pipe out, replacing it with appropriate pipes and appropriate valve gate, and we'll rebuild the berms in those locations. Uh, the the design engineer has admitted the the mistake and. Uh, we will be looking to the design engineer to cover the cost of uh, not only the redesign but the reconstruction of the berm, the both berms. Um, the the design for this this berm uh, here has has been completed. We expect excavation to begin Friday morning. Uh, the design on on the seventeenth berm is is still in process, but we hope to complete that soon. The other so, th so those two berms are one issue area where there's a, a pretty simple problem and a, and a straightforward but um, frustrating fix. <laughs> and then the the other uh, issue we saw was uh, that some of the, you know, the, the a, th a three and a half inch storm in Santa Barbara is about a five year storm event. Some of the uh, some of the smaller ponds along Adam School and coming down here uh, uh, on the side of the 16th fairway and even up here uh, higher up in this watershed were becoming were appeared to becoming overwhelmed with the flow that was coming through and so they did not appear to be sized to the what our scope of work was was which was to handle a hundred year storm event without uh, without being compromised um, so seeing seeing them in action, uh, told us that they were they were undersized and needed to be redrawn uh, or redesigned. The design engineer has acknowledged that as well and has redesigned those areas of the project. And uh, I'm happy to say that uh, we had we had those issues here along the side of the third hole. We had we had them as I explained up in this area as well. Um, all of all of that redesign and construction work will be completed as of this Friday. So um, so by Friday we'll have all we'll have all of the major infrastructure work complete the uh, except for the two large berms and we're starting excavation on those. The contractor expects that each berm will take two weeks to do to to completely take down and put back up. Um, that can be done concurrently as long as he has the design plans and we're working on getting them to him as soon as possible. Uh, so having said that, I, uh, I also want to let you know we, we did go to the City Council on October 27th and requested uh, additional funds to be allocated from the, from the Measure B reserve, uh, $250,000 to use to keep this, keep this work going while we had the sun shining. We will be seeking reimbursement from the parties that uh, were responsible for that for those funds uh. thanks real quick clarification so that 250k um, can essentially be considered a loan to keep the contractors paid and working so that as you say sun is shining let the work continue and then uh, it is hoped that that will be paid back 
uh, I, 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 I would say some of, some of the funds could be characterized that way, I think. What we're, what we're looking at and what we've discussed is a fundamental principle with both the contractor and the, the construction contractor and the design engineer is that uh, where, where the original design was, w was inadequate and the, the design engineer is coming back and designing something that's, that's bigger and so the city is, r is receiving more as an end product, what we'll be looking at is, is paying the difference in the cost but only that differential amount, not the original cost to build what was inadequate. And so, uh, so some of those funds will be used to, uh, some of those funds will be used and will be spent to complete the project. Um, uh, one other thing, we will be, we, we do plan to go back to city council as we're, right now we're working with, uh, uh, pub working closely with Public Works. We're trying to identify the amount of money we'll need to complete the work on the berms and com and and get that project finished before we have uh, additional rain events, and so we will be going back to council with a balance. It could be it could be in the roughly the same dollar amount, another two hundred fifty thousand dollars to get us through completion of the project, um, and uh, and then we'll be seeking reimbursement for for those amounts that were where we had something that was already built, and then we had to go back and deconstruct and reconstruct. Does that make sense? Okay. Mr. Jordan, you got a Thank question? you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to make a, a comment to Mr. Benson, and you can chase it or not as you so desire, but uh, the gentleman's public comment tonight, um, you already touched on, there were a couple of factual inaccuracies as part of that, uh, uh, as part of that comment tonight. And I understand exactly what his issue is, uh, but separating out the uh, the damage that's been caused and his frustration. Um, that site contained considerable both uh, pollution problems and erosion problems before this project began, and, and this project is going to resolve those. Um, it, it also does involve the use of federal funds to defray the costs, and the speaker said it certainly didn't, which is factually inaccurate. And that has, uh, if, if this committee will remember, at one time we vetted and committed uh, our stamp of approval on a 100% uh, burden of Measure B funds, only to be blessed later on in that uh, in that process by almost 50% uh, of that uh, of that expense being uh, borne by the federal TARP funds, and uh, barring the the damage that took place. And however that gets worked out, that is still true, and that has been. That that uh, that situation has been carried back to people in this community also that contribute to Measure B. That uh, this was a, that that it was a a funded uh, a, a grant funded so to speak project that uh, that did not uh, have to be carried in 100 percent by Measure B. Okay, uh, Mr. Chair. First the first the erosion question, then the funding question. Um, Yes, there was there was erosion uh, uh, on the on the golf course. Uh, from there's a significant amount of water that that used to run off of the the neighborhood up here on near Las Positas, off Las Positas Road itself, off the entire uh, Adams School blacktop, which is a significant area. Uh, it ran through a storm drain and then down into an asphalt. Uh, culvert along Adams School and then dumped onto the golf course property and was causing significant erosion over here. There was also uh, pr fairly consistent erosion on this section of the, of the course. Um, those, those will, uh, the, the design of this project will, will contain and control those problems. Um, ha having said that, the, we have a several acre construction site out there now. There's a lot of exposed soil, and so when we have when we have a rain event, we have to be prepared for that. And so we have a lot of uh, stormwater best management practices in place to to deal with that current condition until the time where the plants grow in and protect that soil from erosion. So uh, one of the things that the uh, commenter mentioned was um, uh, coconut. Uh, jute netting, fi fabric that was placed on top of the surface. Uh, 
uh, in some areas that fabric just got hammered because we had a lot of rain. So we've we've taken up some of that fabric and we're replacing it with new fabric so that it's effective for stormwater control. That's not to say that the old fabric is, is wasted. It's a biodegradable product, but it, it actually functions very well where we have rock weir structures and we are we are embedding that fab that used fabric into the rock weir structures that are now being rebuilt because it will actually catch some catch some sediment and hold it in and that, that soil that's caught in that fabric will will essentially act as grout and hold the weirs together. Uh, the fabric itself will eventually decompose and go away. Um, now on the funding, yes, we we received a uh, $1.65 million grant from the um, State Water Resources Control Board in July for, for portions of this project. Uh, that that funding will not be used for any portion of this project related to uh, the use of the of this property as a golf course. So in areas, for example, where in order for us to construct some part of our project, we had to destroy a, a cart path for the golf course. We're rebuilding that that um, that cart path, but we will not be using the federal funding for that type of purpose. Uh, we will also not be using the federal uh, funding to subsidize any of the errors made by uh, either the design engineer or the contractor. Uh, we we treat the money the same way we would treat the Measure B funds, and we we are really uh, looking carefully at all of those at all of those costs to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, so, having said that, we do have you know we do have areas of the project, th as you can see. Many portions of this project are built outside of the play areas. This this map is actually taken off the back of the scorecard for the for the golf course, and uh, virtually all of our construction areas, which are outlined here in red and then and shaded this color, are outside of the the play areas of the course and and don't really serve a function for the course. Uh, they're they're strictly stormwater quality and habitat restoration efforts. I think there will be, an, as, as the commenter earlier mentioned, there will be an aesthetic benefit uh, to them, to, to golfers, but, uh, but that's not really the intent of the project. It's just a side, it's an incidental benefit. So uh, yes, we, we have the grant and the way that operates is we, we spend the money and then we seek reimbursement for those invoices from the State Water Board. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Jordan and Mr. Benson. Uh, I, I see that in the text uh, outline of your report, you have six more items uh, to cover. Would you prefer to take committee questions item by item or have us kind of jot them down and give a, them to you wh when you're completed? Uh, Mr. Chair, that's up to you. This is, this is a big project and we've seen a lot of action on it. And since we've kind of gone down this road, I, I maybe we can we can wrap that up. I think the other items will be a lot faster. Okay, I think Mr. Wilson had his hand up first. Thanks, Chair, not a question. I just wanna compliment Mr. Benson and uh, George Thompson and the rest of the staff working on this project for just being so completely on the ball when the storm event happened, being out there not only that night, but just getting on it for redesign, reconstruction, communicating with city uh, council, dealing with funding. And uh, I think this project is very fortunate to have your uh, attention and uh, um, perseverance and diligence. Thank you for all your great work. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Schluter. Uh, I, <coughs> I have uh, trouble understanding the, the way you described the funding. Mm -hmm. uh, if we contracted for a, a, a design which handled a 100-year storm and that, and that design didn't handle the 100-year storm, I don't understand why we should pee out any money for redesign and bringing the project up to what we've actually paid for. Could you highlight or inform me? Sure. Uh, think of it as there, there are two separate contracts. One is a contract with the design engineer and the other is a contract to build what the plans are that the design engineer created. The first contract with the design engineer was to design a project that, c that could accommodate a 100-year flood event. Um, it seems clear to, to me, to us, that, that uh, the way the project was originally designed was not going to accommodate a 100-year event. It, 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 there, you know, the, the, 
pipes in the in the berms was an, is sort of an obvious issue. The other locations uh, just looked at as though they were in danger of overtopping around s the sides of some of the rock weir, which re weirs, which is in a, which is a condition that can lead to failure of those weirs. And so, um, so in terms of the redesign efforts, we have we have not committed any funds to the redesign. Uh, m uh, my perspective on that is. The redesign is within the, the original scope of work. Right. Move to the construction portion of, of the costs. That's a contractor who bid on that particular set of plans as they were, did, n did not bid on something where they were committed to, to building something that can withstand a 100-year event. They're bidding to, to build those plans. Now that the plans have changed, there's additional work for them. Uh, in some cases, um, you know, so, uh, uh, similar design, but just more, much more robust. And so, but a si significant amount more work for the contractor. Uh, I think it's justified that the contractor be paid for, for their work and doing that additional work. Um, and like I said, where, where the city is getting more, you're getting that more robust construction and an end product, we're going to be paying an additional cost for that. We're just, w what I'm saying is we're going to limit those, that additional cost to the differential in what we were originally paying for. I don't have any trouble with, with, with that at all, except for, of course, the contractor, the construction contractor should get paid for the additional work that he has to do. I don't have any trouble with that. But it seems to me that <coughs> it's the design guy's fault that there are additional co costs being incurred, and so the design's professional insurance should cover that. That's just my opinion on it. You and I'm sure the professional staff at the city have looked into that, but it's just my sense that we contracted with a design engineer for a 100-year project, and we paid for what we thought was a 100-year project. Any errors in that, I don't think, uh, are our financial responsibility, but, and, and I'll just leave it, leave it at that. You have my opinion. The second general area I have is that there were apparently some deficiencies in design. Maybe there are other deficiencies in design. Have we given consideration to a design review or an independent look at this? Or was that done and what happened with that? Uh, are there other problems that we didn't see this time around involved in the design? Thanks. Well, it's a good question. Uh, as this as this project was was being designed, we had uh, uh, the city's public works engineering reviewing the plans at at thirty percent, sixty percent, ninety percent, a hundred percent design. They've been, uh, of course, involved uh, very, very directly, uh, and, and even more so since since we had the storm event and looking looking very closely at uh, at this. I talked to the city engineer. Uh, specifically about the review of these these redesigns, and uh, he has assured me that he and his staff are qualified to to review those redesigns and ensure that the, the that the uh, designs are sufficient. In spite of the evidence that their previous redesign was not adequate. Uh. Thank you, Mr. Schluter. I think the uh, improvements to the upper Las Positas Creek will uh, be an ongoing uh, agenda topic for several more meetings uh, as we do the construction and get through the rainy season. So I think there'll be more opportunities to uh, uh, submit questions. And again, uh, any specific questions that arise from this report uh, can be uh, uh, sent to uh, uh, Mr. Benson and CC the committee members by uh, email. Uh, so we don't have to, uh, we, we can get the topics out now, but if you come up with more specific uh, uh, questions, uh, uh, do submit them. You know, we don't have to wait until now. But uh, hey, hey, after this one last uh, comment by Mr. Schluter, maybe we could allow Mr. Benson to do the other six portions of his report. That's fine. I just have Ro a, want a clarification from you. I thought that if we did an email, to more than three members of the committee, you said to CC the committee. Isn't that a violation of Brown Act? Uh, not, not, not for informational uh, or asking a question, and to let people know that you've asked for more information. 
if you were trying to build a consensus or a majority to recommend or take action or to uh, allocate or appropriate money, uh, that would be a ser that would potentially be a serial meeting and we shouldn't do it. But to simply say, uh, here are three questions that arose from your report uh, at the November Creeks meeting and uh, CCing the other members of the committee that you've submitted those questions, you've asked for a reply uh, before or, or at the next meeting, that would be perfectly appropriate. Okay, that's all. Well, well, that may be legal. I, I, my preference would be uh, to take a very cautious approach with that kind of thing. And, and um, uh, actually, my preference would be if, if anyone, if any committee member has a, has a question for me at any time, to contact me directly, either by email or telephone. And um, I do like uh, committee members to CC the chair. That doesn't get us into a Brown Act problem, but I, I like to keep the chair up to date on what the concerns and qu comments and questions are of committee members because um, I work every month directly with the chair to set up uh, to set up agendas for all of these committee meetings, and if and I like the chair to know what c comments and concerns are raised so that he or she can can raise those as potential agenda items, and we can have a a full committee dialogue about those things. Uh, also, if the chair hears, sees something and says, yeah, I, I had the same question, oftentimes other committee members may have that same qu question and we, we'd like to bring it to the full committee and have a, have a public opportunity for discussion about those items. So, um, you know, those, those, may, those things may technically be within the law to, to, to raise a question like that and have me respond, but I, I'd prefer to do that in a public setting and, and uh, allow the public an opportunity to hear what the questions are. And and uh, hear what the answers are, maybe more importantly. So, um, so moving on, I w uh, this is another uh, capital project that we have underway. It's, it's the other project that we've received significant grant funding for through the stimulus bill. And uh, this is the installation of catch basin screens over all of the openings, uh, catch basin openings I at the curbside throughout the city. Uh, as as you know, this is a project that we had that we had ongoing. So we were uh, shovel ready, which was one of the requirements of, of the grant program. We got just over 1.7 million dollars uh, in grant funding to move this for move this project forward much more rapidly than we had initially planned to. Uh, but it is on schedule. Our our deadline for completion of installation throughout the city is December 2010. So we have uh, about another 13 months or so uh, to complete the project. And to date, we've installed 220 screens. Uh, they've been placed th throughout the west side, up on the Mesa, and in the portion of the city that would be western Montecito, mostly along Coast Village Road. Uh, the next area slated for the installations are up on the Riviera, uh, portions of western San Roque neighborhood, and, and portions of the downtown. And if you'll recall, when we discussed this project at an earlier meeting, uh, one of w one of the places we were going to install these things initially was was in uh, uh, really high traffic uh, commercial areas. Um, we we changed our installation pattern because of the fires and the potential for f for flooding in some of those commercial areas because they happen to also be next to creeks. So uh, we're going to wait and do those installations. That are that are near creek areas in in the uh, in the spring to hopefully avoid any you know any potential contribution or perceived contribution to flooding in those areas. Um, and these are just here's a picture of of a uh, couple of guys out installing the screens, and here's uh, here's a photo of what they look like when they're installed. And the way they, they operate is obviously they block trash and other debris from getting down into the storm drain system, which flows untreated into the into the creeks and into the ocean. Um, that debris is is picked up when the street sweepers go go by. Um, the screens open up when water's flowing through them to to eliminate any any uh, flooding problem. Oops, and that's it for that. Um, just a couple more updates. We have. As, as Dr. Murray mentioned, we have two water quality projects that we, research projects that have been underway for uh, 
a couple of years now. One is our Laguna Watershed Study and Water Quality Improvement Study, uh, our project which is focused on the Laguna Watershed. We also have a microbial source tracking protocol development, and that goes to the um, to the earlier question about about source tracking for uh, for potential pathogens. And uh, as the committee was informed last March, uh, the state due to for e for economic reasons froze the these grant funded projects back in December of 2008 and just last week we received notice from the state that the they were thawing out our projects and that we were going to be ready to we were that if we could meet their new deadline they were setting for us they would be ready to fund these projects so um so we're we're moving forward full speed ahead on on both these projects and we think with some some minor adjustments to our agreement and the timelines in our agreements we're going to be able to complete the projects on on time and we're we're resuming that immediately um, not quite lastly but uh, uh, a member of the committee had requested an up update on our creek tree program uh, so I wanted to to let you know what is going on there uh, uh, the, and as you know, the Creek Tree Program is focused on improving the riparian corridor and along city creeks through planting native riparian trees on, on private property. And what we do is we provide uh, supplies and services to proper, private property owners along the creeks, including installation of the trees and setting up irrigation for those trees. It's all uh, essentially on the upper, upper portion of the creek banks. Unfortunately, the, the program is not going as well as we had hoped. Um, there have been no no new projects actually installed over the last six months. We do have uh, two applications that we're, we're processing, and when I say we're processing them, what I mean is that we are going out uh, working with that property owner. The, the property owner selects the, the types of trees, uh, generally selects where they want the trees, um, and uh, so we're we're in that process right now. I think there's there's virtually no question that those will move forward. And we have a third person who has called us and said they're working on their application. They're getting that in. We anticipate uh, s sometime over the next month to to have installed all three of those projects and approximately 25 uh, new trees. Um, I think what it, one of the obvious questions is why is the project not why is this program not doing as well as we had hoped? Um, I I think we shoulder uh, a huge portion of that responsibility. I think our uh, this is a pro program that we've done outreach on in terms of mail and fo tel you know, uh, follow up telephone calls, but what we found is. Uh, what's what's really going to what it's really going to take for a project like this to be successful is is having somebody going out door to door, and so it's a tremendous in investment of staff time and focus. Um, and we've had our pro we've had our staff so focused on on our capital program that we just haven't had the staff resources to devote to this. And the reason I say I think that's going to be successful is that's the approach we've had to take with our. Uh, invasive removal program where we're in where we're right now we're focusing on Arundo removal and we are literally you know we're identifying where the Arundo is and we're going and knocking on that property owner's door and talking to them about why why we're doing that and what we're doing and what we're going to what we're uh, what the long-term vision is for for that program and we've had a hundred percent success <laughs> Or I should say, almost 100% success. We've only had one landowner who said, I, "I love the Arundo on my property. I don't want you to take it out." But the others have have removed the Arundo and have been very satisfied with the restoration that is growing now in in its place. And so, it just takes really that that uh, focused and direct contact with individual landowners to make a project a program like that successful. Um, Last two things, I wanted to report out on our, our Creek Week uh, event that we had in September of this year. It was our 10th annual event, and we talked about it uh, leading up to it, but I wanted to give you guys a report uh, on what our numbers looked like from that. We had over 1,000 uh, members of the community participate in over 23 events uh, during during the Creek Week, and um, that started off with the with our participation with the Coastal Cleanup Day, which is, was the 25th annual Coastal Cleanup Day on September 19th. 
uh, over two tons of trash and debris was removed from uh, South Coast, or excuse me, county countywide from beaches and creeks. We also had students planting native plants in the bioswale we're working on over at Adams School. Uh, we had a local business, Horny Toad Activewear, had their employees come out and they, they either cleaned or removed and replaced the uh, decals that go on the storm drain markers that say, you know, flows to the ocean. Uh, and they did that in the beachfront in the downtown areas, which is around where their office is located. And uh, as you know, the city uh, uh, puts on uh, Creek Week in partnership with uh, the county of Santa Barbara and the city of Carpentry and the city of Goleta. Count the county, as, part, as one of their efforts, had a rain barrel sale down at uh, Santa Barbara uh, City College where they sold 600 rain barrels in just over three hours down there. Uh, just a, a tremendous turnout, and I think it, it was way beyond their wildest expectations. So that's a nice segue into our last item that I wanted to mention, which is the uh, city and the county are, are sponsoring another rain barrel sale this Saturday, November 21st. It's also going to be at Santa Barbara City College. It's at their parking lot three, which is at the corner of Shoreline and Loma Alta. Uh, street and um, excuse me, I should say drive in the case of shoreline. These are uh, these are I think 50 gallon, 60 gallon, 55 gallon rain barrels. Normally cost $120. They will be uh, sold for $50, including tax. And um, I think we have several hundred of them that are going to be available. So uh, it's 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Saturday, November 21st, City College parking lot at the corner of Shoreline Drive in Loma Alta. And these these rain barrels are effective not only at uh, decreasing demand on, on water supply, they're, they're a good water conservation tool, um, but they also, they also prevent that first flush of water coming off of roofs and so forth from, from going down into the storm drains out in the creeks and oceans. So they're, they, they have the water conservation element with the water quality element as well. And uh, so I'd really encourage people to get down there and, and pick one up and try it out at their house. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Cameron. Uh, are there any questions for the last uh, four portions of um, the uh, operational update for the Creeks program? Uh, I, I was personally able to go to a couple of the Creek Week things, and uh, they were well attended, and the people who were there were very enthusiastic, so uh, I, I think it's a great partnership. Um, I'm glad you're continuing to be actively involved. Thank you, Mr. Chair. One thing I, I neglected to do was uh, recognize Liz Smith, who is our Outreach and edu Education Coordinator, who's sitting to my left over here, I can really kept looking at for, um, for information. Liz, uh, this was Liz's first year uh, organizing that, that entire week-long event, and she just did an absolutely fabulous job. Uh, I, I think that because of her efforts as well as her counterparts at the county and the other cities, uh, we did have a better turnout than we have had in the past, uh, almost across the board at the events. And so we had a lot of new and innovative events and we also had a better turnout and she just did a, a wonderful job and should be commended for it. Um, consider yourself commended. That's fantastic. Um, before we get to the final item, I'd have to ask, um, our year-long calendar has us scheduled to meet again on December 16th, primarily with subcommittee reports, of which uh, today there were none. Uh, are you anticipating that as we get closer to the holidays that there will be uh, enough business to uh, do another meeting? Uh, the short answer is yes, but I think we want to – I think we, you and I will talk – before then, and um, I'll let you. I'll propose some things to you, and we'll, we'll see what you think. And if, if as always, if committee members have uh, have things that they would like to hear about or discuss at the next meeting, please contact the chair or myself directly, and and um, we'll try to make sure that those are included.
Uh, that brings us to item number 11. Is there a motion on that item? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. All right, so at 7.45 p.m., we are adjourned. Oh, and, and best wishes for a safe and happy Thanksgiving to one and all.